the title that you were given was How Extinct Cats Help Explain the World, and I hope that we'll get there. Um, but I also have another title that I, I had in mind, which is um, Everything That Arises Might Converge. And you may have heard the phrase, Everything That uh, Arises Must Converge, but we'll talk about how I'm not quite sure that that's true. So I want to give you a sense of the structure of the talk that I'm going to do, which is we're going to start by asking this question. Why do the same things keep happening over and over and over again? And then we're going to talk about how cats, as my title indicated, may help us to think about that in a somewhat novel way. We'll talk about this, this idea. This is a weird term. I'm just going to introduce it from the beginning, which is local optima, a, an optimum that's not just the, the ultimate optimum, but one that's local to your situation. Uh, and then we're going to try to answer the, the question, why do the same things keep happening over and over again? I'm going to give you the answer right at the beginning, because I really think that one of the things that's difficult about one of these weird mental journeys that I'm hoping to take you on is sometimes you might not remember where we started from. And so there's this concept that in biology was largely sort of popularized by Stephen Jay Gould that there's a times arrow in the history of Earth, and there's a times circle or cycle. And different parts of the way that the universe functions um, are either unidirectional, they're starting in a place and ending in a place, and others cycle endlessly again and again. And that might be examples of big parts of geology. Mountains are raised up and they erode back to the sea, and they raise up and they erode back to the sea. Whereas biology in general seems to obey time's arrow. There is a starting place and things move forward. And yeah, you might see things recurring, but they're not the same things and they're not in the same place. And so you can look through the fossil record, and this is what I do and where my beginning comes from, so with apologies to uh, Fletcher from the beginning, I'm gonna talk a lot about the past in this talk. So yeah, we do wanna fight forward, and hopefully the past can be a tool we use for that. But when you look through the fossil record, you can pick out where you are at any given time by looking at the remains of the organism. So if we see giant dinosaurs, we know we're in the Mesozoic, and we're not yesterday, right? And so because of that, if it was a cycle, you would see the same things coming back again and again. OK, now I'm going to contradict myself, as of course these things do. Um, so the background for all of this is being at the NAT. Uh, and I'm, I can't tell you how proud I am um, to be at a place like the NAT um, that struggles all the time to be a local optima, a place that helps to rise up in uh, every different possible integrative way, um, the region. And so the, the choice that the, that the museum made to be a, a hallmark of the region, meaning similar to our, our talk about Mexican and Californian uh, collaboration, a, a Baja, Cali Baja um, hub, uh, is something that we are always working on, but I'm really proud of that focus, and that will play integrally into my talk. But as, as a postdoctoral researcher, the history of the NAT as a place where people look closely at things. It's one of the oldest museums in the Western Hemisphere collections, and it's probably the third or fourth oldest um, museum entity in the United States, surprisingly old. Only maybe the Calicad is older on the western half of our country. And it, we have a long-standing history of just looking closely at the natural world around us, which is something that people haven't always done, especially in the western uh, world. Um, and so my, my, my way of doing that, as I mentioned, is that I work with vertebrates. A friend of mine made this to make fun of me. Um, but I, so my thing that I look at isn't the zebra skulls that those school children were looking at or the um, eggs that our former curator was looking at. It's bone, and that's a vertebrate hallmark. Every animal that's like us or like even sharks have their, the, the bones that are, make up parts of their teeth and the scales, even though they themselves make their bones out of cartilage, and everything in between, everything that's a vertebrate has bone as a hallmark. And so I'm able to look at this bone is a histological thin section, the same as you might do in a medical lab at UCSD, except that this bone is 122 million years old. And you can still see the blood vessels and the original places for the bone cells preserved in that dinosaur bone. And so that allows us to do things like look at dinosaur reproduction. We have the first um, hist histological slides, first ability to tell things about the growth of a dinosaur of a mother with eggs still in inside her body cavity from China. And so these are the types of techniques that allow us to describe new species, such as this species, Wulong, that I described right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, and to ask really big scale questions about how 
populations of organisms move forward through time. Um, we did a paper in science trying to say how many Tyrannosaurus rex ever lived. Uh, I also don't just work on dinosaurs. After all that beautiful art, here is my favorite piece. <laughs> this is my colleague's daughter who drew this during one of my talks at a professional meeting while she was bored. Uh, I also work on fossil pinnipeds, which is something that's really important to the San Diego region. I don't know if you know this, and we'll talk about this briefly later on in the talk, but the very ground that we're on, those building permits that the county is, is giving out, and the city is, are giving out, are going to be digging into the earth, which has its own history. And so part of what the NAT does through our Paleo Services Department is that we help to reclaim that history, which is part of a city state mandate, but it's also a really important part for us as part of that region to understand the deeper history that uh, precedes us. Some of us may know that the Gaslit District used to have the water lapping right up to it, but what you may not know is that all of this used to be under hundreds of meters of water, and there are whale bones that are found in every construction site that is done down here. And these are million year old whales, not someone's recent acquisition. So we have gorgeous skulls, complete skulls of, of walruses. Now this is the first hint of something with long tusks, but walruses don't technically have saber teeth, which is going to be where we get at the cats finally. So I might ask the question, well, why cats? All these big, interesting questions of life history. And I, I talked about understanding the world as well. Um, I got here, I was so excited to be at this integrative place with all these universities and I could go out and go in the field and, and then COVID happened. Uh, and so I started thinking about this question a lot. A friend of mine who teaches at a community college here, an anthropologist, gave me this mask. Can you read that? Spit spreads death. Spit spreads death. And that's pretty dark, um, but during the middle of, of the pandemic, it sort of made sense to me. Uh, but this is an original mask that was given out in the state of California uh, during the 1918 flu pandemic, which is what this photograph is from. Although if you, you know, made it in color, you might not see too many differences between the two time periods. And so I'm sitting there, you know, we're not even allowed to go into our offices and ask myself the question, like, why does this keep happening? Why, how, could, how could we not have like prevented this again, all right? So we go back to the times arrow, and time's cycle. And I want to be clear, there, I gave you that as a starting place, but I hope to also use that as a warning. I'm going to talk mostly about time's arrow. When I ask the question, why do things keep happening, there's also an aspect of that that's cultural when we talk about big human questions. And that's not something that you can necessarily make a good analogy with the cats. Now, I'll leave it to you to make that, that decision. I just, want to, I just want to use that as a, as a dire warning that you can't explain why people refuse to wear masks or why people have those conspiracy theories that have become issues by looking at what we're going to talk about with cats and evolution. I don't want to fall into that trap. But there's another aspect to this pandemic situation that I hope that we will get to if I can go through my slides fast enough. So there's this famous phrase that I use as my secondary title, everything that rises must converge. It's a great novel by Flannery O'Connor. But the original phrase comes from the writings of this gentleman, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a, had a really interesting life. Um, he was a Jesuit father, and there's a Padres joke there somewhere, but I don't, I'm not sure what, how to, what to make it. Um, and he was also a, a, a stretcher carrier during the worst parts of World War I, and he was a paleontologist who lived in China before the Communist Revolution. A uh, very interesting guy. One of the things he's most famous for is being one of the intellectual forebears of the Peking Man site, Zhou Kodian. And in that site was where they discovered the first examples of early humans in, outside of the Neanderthals and, and in parts of Africa. So it's showing that really early humans had spread all across the world. And ultimately, you know, our forebears prior to our species. Now, this skull is a cast. And the reason for that is because the actual skull was spirited away during the advent of World War II to keep it from being destroyed or claimed by the Japanese. And then it was lost. So there's this epic story of trying to smuggle it onto a train and hide it, and then it disappearing. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it was never seen again. He also, just as an aside, because this is one of my heroes I have to mention, his Western name is C.C. Young, and he ended up being, and is ultimately himself now buried at the Peking Man site, but he worked intently with this Pierre de Chardin character. Now, <laughs> Chardin had this beautiful set of cool life experiences that to him added up to this spiritual journey, 
He was a Jesuit. And he came up with this idea of the Omega Point. And I love that. It sounds like some Dan Brown novel. So I just wanted to say the Omega Point uh, again. The idea was he saw this spiritual movement toward a peak of enlightenment or God or righteousness or however you want to characterize it. I'll let you go to his writings if you want to get that deeply into it. And he also was an ardent Darwinist. He firmly believed in selection uh, and, and, and evolution um, in this post-Darwinian world, and in some ways even preceded the natural synthesis that led to what we think of as modern biology and genetics and, and the like. Um, and so he came to this book where he thought he could figure out this, that evolution would be pushing things upward in the same way that the Bible would, and, and pretty much no one bought it. <laughs> they, people like aspects of, of it, and they just, nope. And so what, what, what did biologists say? Uh, Dawkins, who's always good for a pithy or even problematic word, said that his writing is the quintessence of bad poetic science. And what did the Catholics do? He was literally condemned by the Congregation for the Doctrinal Faith. <laughs> Poor Pierre. But things do converge. So his idea that we're all moving towards some peak doesn't have no merit, or we wouldn't see in that time's arrow some things happening again and again. How do you have ichthyosaurs, giant reptiles in the oceans that look like dolphins today, if there's not any convergence? And so relatively early on in our discussion of, of biology, Darwin picked up on this and wrote about it maybe more uh, uh, relatably, but, but Chardin wasn't onto nothing. So if there is no magic mountain, if Chardin's omega point doesn't exist, then what is going on with this convergence? And therefore, we get back to cats, and you have to ask the same question that I thought you thought I was going to answer about 10 minutes ago, and I mean, really, why? It's like, what? <laughs> I don't know what plans you have here. I want to I say briefly, it's not just that they are cat and cat-like. What does that even mean, right? It's a type of body shape and characteristics that are related to what we call hypercarnivory, which is eating a lot of meat. And so we have to take a moment to talk about carnivores, because you got carnivores, and then you got carnivores. So here are my circles. This is just a real fancy Venn diagram. So there's carnivores, as in things that eat meat. And that's a really big circle that includes things like the early dinosaurs that I talked about, right? Little feathered meat-eating monsters like my Wulong. And that includes, that big circle includes some, but not all of carnivores, which means things kind of related to modern meat-eating mammals, and then capital C carnivores for the group name carnivora, which is the things that we're familiar with today. Weird things might be, uh, look vaguely carnivore-like um, are in that quote carnivores, and things that we're very familiar with are in the carnivores. So the carnivores are an incredibly wide group. They're behaviorally wide. Their, di their diets are wide. Things like the red panda have pretty much adapted now to eating no meat, and they would fall within the carnivora, capital C, but outside of carnivores, meat eaters. But other things have adapted, like our local seals and sea lions, or the northern gris uh, grizzly sister group, <laughs> the, the cousins that have become polar bears, live on the ice all year round, and so many of them never go back to land to being marine. Some of them even fly. Well, I mean, this poor ferret, I don't know. I feel worse for the bird, I guess. It's not really so much flyers. We're talking about deep time here, though, OK? So we're not just talking about the things that we see alive today. We're talking about those whales that are a million years old and things that are 50 times as old as that. So this is the time span of, on the left, the end of the time of dinosaurs. You can imagine a little meteorite, pow, and then all of a sudden, big dinosaurs are gone, and we're back to the age of the mammals. And then these are just group names. You don't have to memorize that. If this was my course, there would be a quiz the first week, but I'll give you guys a pass on all that. But the idea is that there's different divisions based on the fossils, times arrow, that we can de detect going from millions of years in the past to the present. And there are three cat-like things that evolve, not just being a cat, not just being a meat eater, like a real serious, I have to eat meat or I'll die meat eater like a house cat but also evolved to become saber-toothed predators totally independently of each other. So this is a wraparound issue, but the Machairodines were the first thing, and they're related to pretty much nothing that you ever heard of. They're carnivores. The Nimravids are almost cats. They're pretty closely related to cats, depending on how you run the data. Uh, and then, obviously, there's true cats. And then I love this. There's a cat gap. There's a short period in North America where there's nothing cat-like. And during that period, dogs start getting flatter faces. 
and bigger teeth and shorter claws and shorter tails and more meat in their diet. And they purr when you, no, I don't know that part, but, but the bottom line is that they actually start converging again on this cat-like form, some of them. So let's take it from the, the first thing, A, there's machairidines, and this is something that we recently uh, uh, have investigated here in San Diego. So each of these groups has representation here in our museum and in our rocks, and, and then I'll briefly run through each of the stories uh, in a moment. But these are really strange looking things, but you can see that's definitely a saber-toothed animal, right? And then here we have B, this is the Nimravids. Those are those false saber-toothed cats. We have our state fossil, which I've also brought a copy of here for you guys to see, right? This is, we have a state fossil in California, and that is Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat, okay? This is a serious beast. This is a cast of one from the La Brea Tar Pits, the Tar Pit Tar Pits, if you want to translate that from the Spanish. Um, and, that's the same thing up there. This one's just painted to look like it's from the tar pits, that beautiful black, right? Um, we also have a state dinosaur from one specimen, Augustinolophus, but that's in the LACM, and it's terminally uncool compared to this guy. <laughs> oh, I, just so you know, the M, which I, in my next diagram is like way out there in not normal carnivores, like capital C, is actually, this is a saber-toothed mammal too, but it is a marsupial. It's only found in the 20 million year old rocks of South America. South America was a, another planet for a while, but we have marsupial saber-toothed cats too. We're not gonna get into that today. That's too much to deal with. And there's none in our area. So San Diego saber tooths I said, each of these groups, forgetting the marsupial thing, are represented here, and they're really important to asking really cool questions. And part of that is that biogeography was mentioned um, in my intro, thank you. Most of what we know comes from these basins, these big open spaces, badlands areas in the Rocky Mountains, or from a very rarely encountered material over in Asia. San Diego then, look how much space is empty, and San Diego fills in a huge part of that gap biogeographically. And so we can re reconstruct, get an idea of what San Diego looked like millions and millions of years ago because we have this window in time. So this is a really cool tooth I'm very excited about. This is this tooth, the lower canine, of an animal that's even bulkier than our state fossil Smilodon. And this is found here in the San Diego formation, some of the same rocks that make up the Mesa, where Bell, Bell Park is today. And it would have been something very similar to our, our state fossil when it was live. We have more parts of this limb bones that are robust, uh, other teeth. The weird thing is those rocks, the San Diego Formation, are what we're most famous for. That's where those whales come from. And so this question of, well, how do we get a cat in there is interesting. And it takes very careful work with the geology, which is one of the benefits of living in a state and a county where we have this agreement that we're going to do good scientific work and preservational work when we do construction sites that use public money. Um, and we can do that fine scale ge geology work to realize that there's these brief moments where the ocean goes out and we're capturing beaches. So, not, so we have something that's really cool. We can reconstruct not only these moments in time, but also we can learn that they are not just up in the tar pits or up in the mountains, in caves, they're actually on the beaches. And there's a comparable thing for this today in the desert of Namibia in Africa, there are prides of lions that now that the wars in that part of the area, uh, world are dying down, have started returning and hunting on the beaches and scavenging uh, whale carcasses. So maybe San Diego would have looked something like that in the past. We can also use these cat groups to understand the origins of really important things, not just of the cat groups themselves, but of major parts of ecology. Where does meat eating come from? So this is our, our animal that we named. This was covered in the Tribune, which is really cool. Um, this is Diego Alures, named for the city and the county. Uh, and this is not a cat at all. This is one of those animals, the Machairidines, the weird saber-toothed thing that predates them, predates the existence of cats by 10 or 12 million years. We can also use other cat groups to see deeper into the process of life itself. So that's evolution and the changes of ecosystems that happen as the earth changes. So during the Middle Eocene, again, I'm not, I'm not quizzing you, but this is something like 50 million years ago, San Diego was a rainforest. We had primates swinging through the trees, we had tapers and rhinos running underneath them, and we now know that we had those machairidines, those 
Diego Aluris, we have a name for it now, climbing around in the trees and jumping down to hunt them. And there were so many other weird carnivores, some of them still unstudied that we had from, from this time period. But those are all replaced, you can come to our museum and see some of them in their natural habitat, uh, by a very pastoral, very calm grassland environment. And we don't really know what happened between them, but at this point, all of those weird carnivores, myacids, Diego Luris, are gone, and all you have left are nimravids and dogs. Very modern things, catty things and doggy things. So that's post-cat gap. And now we have some of the earliest fossils showing that those cat-like things preceded that, and they were here in, in that complicated time. So you can kind of see, this doesn't look like very much, that, that fossil. It's a scrappy bit of the slicing teeth that the animal uses to eat meat, but that's enough, much more than has ever been found before that early, that we can put into what we call a, a phylogenetic analysis, which is a family tree. And we can learn that, so don't worry about the details here, but the bottom line is it's meant to just impress you with a bunch of colors, okay? So this is a family tree that's generated from all that data we can, we can get from those teeth, and it shows us that the San Diego nimravids are really, really early, which is telling us something about how meat eating evolves in the world, and that's a small part of the animal. It gives us a very sketchy picture, but that sketchy picture is infinitely better than no picture at all. So we can start to say, we might not exactly be able to bring this into focus, but we know that they were there. And then at the highest level, so we have these three different groups totally independently becoming cat-like, and each of them can tell us really interesting stories that I've only just barely touched with you today. But at the highest level, we can go back to this question. If there's not a single mountain, but we know that there is some upward motion, something is making these things become cat-like, right? Then where did Pierre Chardin go wrong? And so I would posit that he was so focused on the peak, so focused on like trying to climb this mountain that he had imagined, to get to some convergent thing in his religious beliefs, that he didn't think about what happens when you reach the peak. So I don't know if any of you guys have utilized our wonderful uh, city and state park systems or climb Palomar or any of these other things. What happens when you get to the top of a mountain and you look around? What do you see often? Perspective. You get some perspective, but rarely, unless you're in you know, Washington, are you the, on the only mountain around? You see more and more and more peaks, right? So there is no magic mountain. There are magic mountains. And this is where we get to this idea of local optima, not a single optimum. There is no omega point. There are many alpha, beta, gamma, delta points, okay? And so maybe one of these points is being a dog, and another one of them is being a cat. But if you're down in a valley, anywhere close to being a cat, and you can start making your way up that mountain, then you're going towards a better way of life, and that's something that evolution can drag you towards, right? You're slightly more cat-like, you succeed slightly better, you have slightly more baby kittens, and then they're slightly higher up the mountain. And this landscape can be super, super intense, very varied. There can be many, many peaks, many, many ways of making a living. But we have to focus on what your local optima might be. And you can even use this to potentially predict the future. So uh, this figure, a little complicated, but you can imagine this is just one mountain, right? And you have two different starting points. Phenotypes are just what things look like. So something looks like that, something looks like this. And then they succeed. They're each, ever always going up but they're taking very different paths to get towards that same peak, right? So maybe this is our weird non-cat thing that eventually ends up looking very much like a cat, and this is an actual cat whose ancestors looked very different, ends up looking like a cat, right? Today, we have no saber-toothed cats. So all of this time, multiple times, saber-toothed cats have evolved, and then this thing was one of the last ones, and it goes extinct just about the time that the first Native Americans sort of have established long-standing civilization in California. So is that coincidental? We don't know. But the bottom line is, less than 10,000 years ago is a very different time than now, because we live in a, a world, a universe maybe, without saber-toothed cats. There's one animal that some really cool research has shown might be higher up on that peak, that local optima of saber-toothed cat, than anything else, and that's the clouded leopard, which is a highly endangered, medium to big cat in Southeast Asia. Neophilus nebulosa, I like that name, nebulosa. And it's been proposed on the basis of that giant gape, which is necessary if you have real big teeth, 
as well as the size and the dimensions of the teeth and the diet, that that's the closest analog we have, the most likely thing to become saber-toothed cat-like. And so if we make decisions on the basis of that knowledge, we might have a different attitude toward preserving the natural world. Maybe if you have to ask this question, well, is there a difference between just genetic diversity versus genetic potential? And that's a very nebulous, cloudy thing to look at, even with something like cloud leopard, but it, it maybe begins to give you a different perspective on making these important decisions as you think about where life can go into the future and what part we might have in that. Another thing I'll point out is that this graphic is not about cats. This is taken from a recent paper in Cancer Biology. So this idea of local optima and convergence is not something that's just, oh, he's waving his arms about fossil animals 50 million years ago. Phenotype B over here is one cell line with a different genetic background from phenotype A. And yet, in the human throat, in the human pancreas, they go undergo this selection, cell by cell by cell by cell, to end up looking the same, and at that reddish peak, they become cancerous. So this concept of time's arrow pushing things to happen again and again and again because it's better on the, on the peaks is something that we can use to understand everything from why there are multiple saber-toothed cats to disease etiology. And so this idea of time zero versus time cycle is a fairly Western thing, but I think it has some depth to it. and something that I come back to again and again. And I think that applying that to this divided thinking helps us to understand my question of how could COVID happen again? How could we be back here? So the time's arrow aspect explains how you could have a new illness become a pandemic again, because there's a peak there. That's becoming a specialist and being transmitted between humans, even to our detriment, is no different really from being a specialist on jumping on big mammals and biting them in the neck, right? It's a way of living that changes your ecology and your shape. And so when I go back to thinking about this question about how we could be here again, there's the times arrow aspect that I can use cats at least to just start to understand how we could again have a pandemic. And I'll leave it to you to think about how time cycle and the systems that we put into place might lead to the other aspects of what it's like to be in a pandemic, both good and bad. So please, uh, I hope that you'll use, if this found this interesting at all, come check out our museum. And um, we have a new exhibit opening soon. I just want to put this up here specifically about Baja because you know we're talking about um, our local region and I really love that regional aspect of our museum. So anyway, thank you very much.